they all missed this and I got it. Like, what up? You know, like, where is my mountain? Give me a mountain. And then also put my name on it. Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi. We're exploring how and why. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. And Adrian's here. Hey, everyone. I'm back. Remotely, notably. Distanced. We were just recently talking about we have to get you back, like, visiting physically. And then uh, the world started then, so now here we are. Uh, I'll, I'll be over when uh, when I'm allowed outside of my apartment. This is going to be a good one. We've been working. We've been working on this. I wouldn't say we've been working on this. We've been, been forgetting this about, over the last year. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> We've been uh, approaching finally doing this episode for at least a year, probably more. And it's fine. It's exciting that it's finally here. Uh, Adrian. Yeah. What movie did we watch? We didn't. We didn't watch a movie, Chris. Pranked. Lil JK. It was a book. N- nice. Which some of us read with our eyes and some with our ears. <laughs> A year ago, so we'll see how that goes. Adrian, hey, what do we do? Uh, we read the three body problem by Wikipedia says Leo Sishin. Although I don't have any faith in my Chinese pronunciation. That's right. If there are tones there, I didn't use them. I'm going to say, um, which we do when things are important. This book was excellent and very important, and you should definitely read it before continuing with this episode. Notably. The biggest science fiction work out of China ever, and the first Hugo Award winner out of Asia. And uh, we are covering the first book, because this is part of the Remembrance of Earth's Past series, which is three books. The first one is called The Three Body Problem, although colloquially, it seems people just refer to the entire series by the name of the first book, which is a little confusing, which required that clarifier. So we are covering book one, because Adrian only read the book one, right? Only read the first one. That's it. Would we be able to get you to do the rest? Um, yeah. I mean, if you do Decipher Sci-Fi episode 1000, I will consider reading a second book. That's, that's <laughs> quite a bit in the future. Yeah. There'll yeah. probably be a movie out by then or something. Uh, the second and third book are the best parts. And this book itself by itself is amazing. So I can't I can't heap enough praise onto the entire trilogy. I think the world generally agrees with my with my review here. Okay, maybe uh, maybe I'll go the audiobook way. So not normal for us to do a book, but just sometimes something is so exciting and special and full of ideas that it's worth interrupting our normal flow, trying to get people to actually read a book with their eyes or ears, rather than like the 90-minute movie investment that we're usually asking for. I think we should point out that uh, we did cover a movie that was based on a short story by the same author. Which one was that? It was The Wandering Earth. Just speaking about the like breakthrough of uh, just media. Yeah, the, this author now, especially on the back of this work, is super famous in China. As much as this is doing very well in the West as well, super duper famous in China. So you should expect to see multiple adaptations of multiple works from the author over time. There was supposed to be one from this book already, uh, let alone the trilogy, in fact, they filmed it in 2015 and then just never did it, like just never published it, which seems to be a sign that it didn't go so well, perhaps. Uh, I want to mention we did a book one time, Seven Eves, which was really early on in Decipher Sci-Fi History, but that was an excellent book that was worth our coverage. I would like to do another book if we were to do Blind Sight. I think Colbert is on the same age as that was remarkable. Only 384 pages. That's fairly doable. And it's Creative Commons, so freedom oh. or whatever. Wonderful. And so wait, Colbert, somebody was mentioning how we read this book. I read the book with my ears. How did you read the book, Adrian? Uh, on my Kindle. With your eyeballs. And Colbert, with your eyeballs? Yes, I also read this with my eyeballs. And I had the advantage of having um, additional information from the translator, which was super helpful. Yeah, I feel like, um, and and the reason I mentioned that I read it on an ebook was because I feel like I I clicked on uh, footnotes any sing- every single time there was one just to get more context out of it. Because a lot of times, was, is, what was this historical event? Who was that general? Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of like Chinese cultural history stuff that I none of us in this room, I'm pretty sure, had any idea about. And right. maybe if I had known that those were in the book, 
when you read it with your eyes, I might have read it with my eyeballs for once, although I find it very difficult to sit still like that. Uh, I did the audiobook, and the whole time I'm just like, well, that's confusing, but Chinese book, what are you going to do? I missed out on a lot of information, probably. So now you guy, you two are Chinese cultural history experts based on the footnotes, apparently. Yeah, naturally. Uh, and I missed out. Immediately after having read the book, yes. <laughs> now, not so much. <laughs> you you got to imagine, this is a v- the sort of book that could be very difficult to translate, and reportedly from the two translators that worked on the, the trilogy together, uh, alternating. It was very difficult to adapt just because we have a very large book and it's like super crunchy, hard sci-fi where you have to have the technical, mathematical and physics chops to to be able to make sense of all the things the guy's saying and include all the cultural context and the translations of the different idiomatic, whatever. There's a lot of work there apparently to be done and it was part of the reason for it to take years to actually make it into English because it did. Because the first book came out in 2008. And the English translation wasn't published till 2014. The subsequent books then taking a while themselves. The adaptations for this were supposed to happen already. We mentioned that a movie was filmed in 2015 that just didn't come out ever. Uh, there's also Amazon was in talks about a series at one point around the time of The Wandering Earth coming out. I don't know what happened with that. There's an anime coming up in like 2021. And there's an ongoing unofficial fan-made Minecraft animated series, which is, it sounds like that would be bad. And the first season is a bit amateur, but season two and three are like a real serious production. And it is, from what we have now, the most accurate adaptation of this work. So while we were kind of waiting for a movie to happen, ultimately, before giving up and doing this book episode. It was made of Minecraft. You you actually, you have the Minecraft option right now. They're on the second book in season three of the show. I have trouble taking seriously a Minecraft animated series, though. Like, it just looks like a kid thing. Wasn't, um, not that it was done in Minecraft, but wasn't Red vs. Blue done in Halo, and that was really successful and well done? That was a comedy. That didn't feel weird to me. It was well done. Got it. And since this is, you know, serious science fiction, it's a different genre. Yeah. Although, if you do, if you look at season three versus season one, the production is high enough that I'm starting to be able to feel like maybe I can get over that hurdle. Even though they still have square heads. How much visual nuance do you get, though, in Minecraft? A lot. I don't understand how it works. Like, I don't know how much of that's the engine versus something else someone's doing. It's it's there. I just, I have no idea how it works technically. So, uh, back to the show, though. So, spoiler alert, we're going to spoil the book. We are going to spoil, I really, really want to try, unless I get confused, to only spoil the first book of the trilogy. Because there is so much stuff in the other two. And I can't wait to get there. It's just not for today. And we have to figure out how to finally do more book episodes. Yeah, actually, when we were doing the rundown for this, <laughs> it was pretty much, oh, well, just almost all that's in the second and third book. Yeah, sorry about that. It's fine. They're, they're all so full of stuff. I'm glad we're doing this because also it would have been three hours long to try to talk about all that stuff between all these different things. Because it spans such... It, it, it goes over such a huge span of ideas and topics and space time, and it's crazy. So I'm glad we're going to concentrate on something. And it's the first book. Adrian, spoiler, we're going to spoil the movie or show or what is it called? It's a book. Uh, <laughs> what is for? <laughs> what is the three-body problem, the novel, the first book about? It's about aliens um, making contact with Earth. That's not how it's laid out. That's, you know, what by the point, by the end of the book that's what it's about it's about aliens having made contact with earth and they're coming over to invade us basically but how the book plays out is um some physicists start noticing physics seems to stop working properly um there are a bunch of suicides uh by physicists because physics doesn't appear to be real anymore um there's also a video game which is basically a test for um this group of people who want to usher in the aliens coming to the earth uh, coming to the earth and taking over because we're just so bad at being people <laughs> um so there's that aspect of it there's some and then there's actually the communication with the aliens so some people have made contact with the aliens uh and they're communicating um it's there's a lot going on but yeah it's about aliens coming to the earth um they don't get here in the first book i don't believe 
but there's, you know, the uh, the setup to them coming. It's interesting. So you're like, it's about first contact. And I would say even it's the most, ultimately, the most scale accurate first contact story I can remember ever seeing or reading, where it's like, oh, there's actually hundreds of years of travel between us. And how are we going to handle that, right? But the back of the book just kind of spoils the whole thing because that's buried. It's two thirds of the way in the book before you really get an idea of what's actually happening. Let me read this for you. This is why I don't watch trailers. It's this sort of thing. Setting us the backdrop of China's cultural revolution, <clears throat> a secret, and that's the sort of stuff where I really would have appreciated the footnotes. A secret military project sends signals into space to establish contact with aliens. An alien civilization on the brink of destruction captures the signal and plans to invade Earth. Meanwhile, on Earth, different camps start forming, planning to either welcome the superior beings and help them take over the world, or fight against the invasion. The result is a science fiction masterpiece of enormous scope of vision. Agree with that last part. But, man, they really just gave it away. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> a lot of information from two-thirds of the book on. <laughs> I know. What a bummer, huh? Yeah, I forgot. I, th- there was the whole aspect of how we were... I And, again, it's been a while since we read this book, but I'm starting to remember more and more of it now. But there is a point in the book where... Uh, it's discussed how we send a signal to this other planet Um, because they're far away and you know you need you it's it's extremely hard to send a clear signal far away because of inverse square law right like if you broadcast in every direction at all at the um, in every direction from the earth it's going to fall off like inverse square right because you know you're you're basically broadcasting in a sphere so the the power falls off like um, like bits of area, right? So inverse square. So even if you're like super directed and you and you shoot a laser exactly at the at you know at the target, lasers still spread a little, so you're still gonna lose, you know, pretty much inverse square like um, with your power. So it is extremely hard to send a signal. And now I'm rem- remembering that there was this weird science fiction discussion about like sending signals into the sun and then somehow there's a reaction in the sun which boosts the signal. So if you can get the power of the sun as your transmitter, then you have a better chance of actually communicating with the other planet. Right, yeah. Like for example on the inverse square, like we have the laser experiment on the moon that we talked about before. Yeah. Just an example of a spread. The reflector on the the reflector on the moon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that thing is several feet across, but by the time our beam reaches the moon's surface, we're talking as if several kilometers, you know? And that's only at the moon, which is right next door. Now imagine trying to communicate with another star. Yeah, and that's with us sending as as directed a laser as we possibly could. Everybody thinks of a laser as like this thing that doesn't spread. Like you have a light bulb, it goes everywhere. You have a laser, it's this perfect cylinder of light. It's not, it spreads. <laughs> um, it's just our scale is so small whenever we use one on, our, on the surface. Right. Yeah. Right, like the the pl- the Earth looks flat at you know normal human scales, just like a laser looks like it's confined at, at human scales. But no, it spreads over the distance to the Moon or the Sun or other planets. The mechanism they use in the book that's not very well explained, but it's sort of this uh, sci-fi hand wave of we're using the Sun's atmosphere to somehow amplify the signal. It was like a it was described as a resonant frequency, and that the star was being plucked like a string. From the book, as I recall. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, yeah, that's not. I, I, I'm, I'm no uh, solarologist, but I'm pretty sure that's not <laughs> how the sun works. Um, hey, dude, who knows? Indistinguishable from magic, etc. Exactly. Uh, I just like the idea that we're still like this is the '60s when that happens in the story. So we're still like basic ass humans, barely been off the planet. In fact, no, none of the humans have been off the planet at that point. I think by the time it happens in the story. And we're able to sort of like reach just over the lip into like the next level of civilization that we don't really deserve yet and take advantage of this thing to reach out in a manner which we really, uh, it turns out, might have been stirring the pot a little more than you would have liked. The idea that we are the lowest possible class and we sort of accidentally stumbled into uh, we can say hey to other stars. (laughs) <laughs> send, a, <laughs> send a you up to Alpha Centauri <laughs> to all of the stars it's like giving a caveman a smartphone uh, the thing we should I think we should summarize slightly and chronologically because the book does do like a flash forward flashback sort of something and a bunch of it takes place in the now like 2012 or whatever uh, that, now ish that's why that review was so spoilery because a lot of it is hidden in you know secret program 
and it's the revelation of what was going on. Only decades after the fact in real time, right? Yeah. The uh, the chronological beginning is that there are intelligent aliens on a planet between the Centauri star systems. What do we call? It's called the Alpha Centauri system. Okay. So this planet has developed in the Proxima Centauri system. In the oh, has developed in the Alpha Centauri system where there are too many suns. That's the basic problem. <laughs> They're just very unfortunate that like one sun's pretty good. Two suns is like kind of difficult, but also pretty good. Like things can happen. Three suns is just a shit show. And yeah. you're in for a war to hurt. And that's what they find out because they evolve in this planet where climate swings wildly to hot and cold extremes for millennia at a time. And if life is to gain a foothold, it winds up being life that is able to basically do the water bear dance and dehydrate and bury themselves for millennia at a time in between actual uh, habitable climate periods. Except it's worse than that because also the apocalypse happens. Yeah, yeah. So when I say extremes, it's not just extremes. It's like, what if the sun burned off your entire surface? (laughs) But also, also, it's not just that it's, you know, millennia long um, uninhabitable uninhabitable periods. It's also seemingly random and i'm using quotes um uninhabitable periods so um one thing that i mean this is this is this is what the the book title is about the three body problem you have three suns you also have you know a planet or actually it's a multi-planet system um but the planets are um orbiting a star that's being that's interacting very closely with two other stars. And that's, you know, the three body problem is you have these three massive bodies and unless they're set up perfectly, their, um, their mutual orbits are going to be chaotic. So the, the three stars are going to swing like, you know, one is going to swing close and then it's going to be far away for a long time. And then there's just no way to, there's no way to predict in a short form without doing like very specific, um, numeric calculations, what they're going to do anytime soon. It's like calculating the weather, you know, like, you you know, in the short term, it's going to be, you know, I can, I can tell you what it's going to be in a minute outside my window. I can probably tell you what it's going to be um, tomorrow outside my window within, you know, like, five to 10 degrees. But if I were to try to tell you what it's going to be outside my window in a month, no chance, you know, I can use like, seasonal data but you know that could be completely off we could have a freak cold day or a freak hot day Um, the further out your projection the greater the computational requirement very quickly approaching impossible like like technically impossible yeah there's no good straightforward numerical predictor there's no closed form solution and what does that mean it means that there's no like so if i throw a ball right um, in a constant gravitational field, there is an exact equation that I can feed it a time and y- the function will return to me the position of the ball, right? Just a and standard Newtonian cannonball move. St- yeah, and, and we, okay. can even, we can even do better than that. Let's say the, f- the, the um, gravitational field is static in time, but is like wildly fluctuating. It's like this weird field that has different values at every point. We could still probably, depending on how weird the field is, return one of those functions. Um, okay, my, my PDE teacher would be yelling at me right now, but um, <laughs> y- y- but when you start getting like into double pendulums and three-body problems, you get into chaotic systems. You get into systems where a um, where the 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 deviation of the input is um, an exponential deviation or more in the output of the function. So like you, mm. yeah, it, Small perturbations at the beginning become, you know, un, un um, calculably large later on. But closed form basically means like with standard calculus you'd learn in high school or the first few years of college, you, you could write down that equation. And so imagine you're an, uh, uh, ultimately, finally, somehow a technological sim- civilization that is still at for forever and ever wondering like what the hell is going on and having millions of years to finally keep civilization continuous and start to realize what situation you are even in. It's not the gods being fickle. It's you're in 
a chaotic physics simulation. Or no, not a simulation. Uh, you're in a chaotic physics situation, unfortunate for right. you. Right. So, you know, anybody can come up and be like, oh, tomorrow it's going to be, you know, uh, one of the hot seasons. And they could be right, right? Like, flip a coin and, and it'll predict, you know, the the outcome of a, of a thing, you know, right 50% of the time. But like, as you flip that coin more, you, you lose, you lose, you know, the ability to predict things. You, you can have a random system be right, or you can have a person be right about this system a little bit at a time and you can put a lot of faith in them. And then, you know, they're wrong because their model was off. Um, we see this in the video game, the multiple predictive models that people try to uh, come up with. Right. And those people gain power, right? In the video game, they're represented by, I think they're uh, philosophers, right? Or philosopher kings. Um, And they'll be right for a little while because they were right once. They were like, you know, it's going to be a hot season for three days. And like, ooh, they were right. Let's make them king. And then, you know, (laughs) they're wrong because their their model was just, hey, I'm just going to consult like pig's blood or whatever. Um, Yeah. But only when they started discovering, oh, well, this is how gravity works. Oh, I can make a prediction about now and then I can recalculate tomorrow and be more accurate about a prediction the next day. Then they start developing this science and it's because they were allowed or they were able to dehydrate themselves, put themselves in stasis and then come out after um, the calculation said to. And everything we learned about the Trisolar, that's what they're called, the Trisolarans, those aliens, uh, millions of years ahead of us just slowed down by their physics situation. Everything we learned about them is from that video game, which is basically a history lesson and cultural introduction to how they came to be. It really does serve to show the analog between how, really, just between humanity and those aliens. As different as they want to be, uh, it's still kind of a story that feels very familiar. What does an intelligence do? adrift in the sea of space uh one thing i remember while um when i was reading the book was if you're a trisolarian right and you're on this planet and you're trying to develop a system you know a physics you're trying to develop a model of the universe and you have you know at the beginning you don't know much you try to predict like cycles are the most simple system right like two days on five days off two days on five days off like that's that's something that's incredibly under uh easy to understand for you know even children, right? Like, but if you see that you're, you know, you have a a dry season for a thousand years, you have a a temperate season for, you know, like four months, and then you have a dry season for six seconds and that, or like you have all these randomly seeming things, it would appear to you as if there is no model, right? And this is a theme that comes up again, uh, at least one more time in the book, like, just because the model isn't apparent doesn't mean there is not an underlying model, right? So the Trisolarans in their infancy, they don't understand the universe. They don't understand why, you know, they have to dehydrate themselves. Why these suns or like, you know, why the sun gets so bright sometimes and for how long that it doesn't make sense. There is no rhyme or reason to it, but it's because they're in this chaotic system and they weren't um, sophisticated enough to figure it, that out. Right, and that's that's a theme that comes up again in the book. We still have issues, surprise, surprise, with three body systems, and we're finding. I mean, we haven't mastered the universe yet. We have not. <laughs> However, we're finding if you need approximations, when you can do estimations of systems, neural networks tend to be very computationally cost effective and fast. Where you when you can't throw a ton of computational power at a problem. We're finding neural networks can actually give you answers. Now, they have to be trained, and they're not generic. So you're not going to be able to <clears throat> apply to any situation you know, 5,000 years out, but it can give you very quick answers for the near term, at least currently. And this is, this is where we're finding advances in this area on actual Earth? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Recently, yes. But like Adrian said, right, there's... Uh, there is a pattern, your failure to see the pattern in the physics behind the thing that's happening doesn't mean it's not there. It just means like you need to really, you know, uh, you just might lack the very complex model that would actually represent this. Or, I mean, in the case of like 
okay, so gravitation is not an easy model. Newtonian gravitation is is pretty easy. But even from Newtonian gravitation, you can get chaotic systems. Like the model, the model being simple does not imply that the outcome of running the model is simple, if that makes sense. I mean, like Conway, rest in peace, Conway's Game of Life um, shows that, right? Like you get this these two rules live if this die if this in a you know an eight cell system and you can build a turing machine out of that and that's like a ridiculously simple model that yields full computability like simple simple model does not imply simple um outcomes or you know simple determinism or however you want to put that okay so then bear in mind by the time that were actually in the book, and the humans are making first contact with the Trisolarans, they have figured this out. They do know the circumstances of their star system, their trinary star system. They know that they are actually doomed ultimate. This isn't this is the first book, right? Yes. They know they are doomed ultimately to have their planet rendered apart by the, you know, tidal forces between these different stars. They've made it as far as they could. So when Earth accidentally sort of kind of stumbles into, hey, we can stay high to another star system for the first time. The the Trisolaran that receives the message is nice enough to see the Earth set high. Think about what would happen if anyone knew and send the message back, shut up and do not reply to this message. Like, you do not want to make contact with us. Stop. I forget the, does anybody remember the actual quote? It was short. I just don't remember the words. Do not reply. Uh, Do not reply. Do not reply. So, uh, our first alien contact, we had a friendly one, but the message that's conveyed is worrying. And that's borne out because when they reach out again, because when humanity reaches out again, that is basically signing our death warrant. Yeah. They are, at this point, way more technologically advanced than we are. Like, not even, you know, not even, we're not even ants to them. We're less than ants. But, and here's my favorite part of the whole thing. They know that they are leaving their planet. They're going to go to, they they know Earth is nearby. It's a pretty nice looking place from what they could tell from 400 light years away. How far is Proxima? Yeah, it's, it's as close as you're going to get, which is bad news for aliens that might want to take us (laughs) over. Uh, But this is my favorite part. Like when I said this was the most scale accurate first contact scenario I've ever seen before in fiction, it was because there's a radio message, light speed where we say, hey, they say, hey, and they say, by the way, we're going to come and evade you now because uh, we need a planet. It's uh, you up to be conquered. <laughs> and then from that moment, though, there's 400 something years of travel, relativistic speeds, but still like they are, they, they haven't done FTL. They have 400 something years of travel after they start their trip to finally make it here. So they know that by the time, if humanity finds out that someone's coming to get them in 400 years and they're taking that long to get there, they know that humanity can very possibly with the resources it has exceed. Catch yeah. Catch up or even exceed them technologically and be able to fight back by the time they get here. Especially when you don't have three stars obliterating you every once in a while. Right. Yeah. Right. Like all the first contact scenarios are the aliens show up and wipe us out, which is the smart move. But there are so many stars. How likely is it they happen by as much as in the way that it happens in the book? Aha. So here's where we get to like the most of the story by volume, I think, which is humanity has reached out. The aliens have started to come yet, have started to come over, but no one knows really that they are. And they start messing with our shit. Yeah. Because if you know humanity's going to exceed you, maybe you could interfere enough that they are slowed down. Right. Um, The theory by the uh, Trisolarans is that all major advances, so every every civilization advances in a very minor way continuously, right? Like we make small improvements, small improvements, small improvements. But if you think about like the biggest improvements that happen to civilization, um, they come with fundamental, better fundamental understanding of the universe. So for instance, we were pre-electricity and we are post electricity or during electricity. We're not post-electricity. We haven't moved on. It's still very good. But where did that come from? <laughs> that came from the a, a much, much, much better understanding of how light 
and the and electromagnetism works. So before we understood that, you know, we knew about prisms, like that was it. We knew about prisms, we knew about mirrors, and that was our understanding about light. But then we started, you know, like Ben Franklin, whether or not, I don't know, is that a real story with the key? I don't think so. But like, it wasn't until we started actually mastering the photon that we get computers, we get the internet, we get, actually, that's it. You know, computers and the internet. No, we those get Those are pretty good, get, though. Yeah, those are, those are amazing. <laughs> those are transformative. You know, we are in the information age right now, and that would not have happened if we didn't understand the physics of photons. And that's it. And so the Trisolarans say like, okay, well, if Earth is going to defend itself in, you know, however many years it takes us to get there, they're not going to do it with the, what they have now. They're not going to do it with minor improvements of what they have now. They're only going to do it if they start making real advance or more advances in the understanding of, um, of fundamental physics. Um, maybe we get better at gravity, you know, like by understanding the Higgs boson or... Maybe there's some there's some physics that we actually have never even noticed before. Like there's some subtle fifth force that we don't know. Um, so as Chris said, they start messing with us. And I guess if you're going to look for, if that's your line, like you're, they're heading towards this, a better understanding of of basic, of fundamental, I should say, of fundamental physics. They can see that we have colliders up. That's the path forward. So the idea is to mess with those projects such that they yield no fruit, and the people running those projects so that they can't do their job. And that's where something that I think, if I recall, bugged you when you were reading the story at first. It really did. I actually- Which is the thing you did mention earlier, which is the scientists and physicists finding that the universe is not working like they thought anymore, like something's weird and unreliable. And yeah. that was upsetting in a way that causes suicides. Right. So I did bounce off this book two or three times before um, not only you two, but other friends of mine were like, no, 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 stick with it. And Because this yeah, is like well, right in the beginning of the book, too. I can see how yeah, that would it's, happen. Well, it's 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 after. So the book starts with um, with like I don't the revolution. Know, uh, the revolution. Yeah, exactly. And then it moves on to this. So, yeah. So what it is, is there are very smart people who notice that it's not just that the physics looks wrong. That's fine. That's actually all of science. Yeah, that's a new thing we learned. Good job. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, It's that it looks like there is no model. So that's that's the thing that bugged me. Um, It's a very easy conclusion to make that there is no model, but... If you are a trained scientist, if you are a mathematician, and I'm going to lump them in there as well, you know that or it is your faith that there is a model, right? That's like your entire thing. Um, whether or not the current understanding of the model is correct, never that never messes with the um, faith that there is an underlying model. So if, like, let's say I'm a physicist or a mathematician, and I see that, like, oh, well... In the case of, I, I think we're going to bring up the Ted Chang book, like one plus are. one equals three. Um, you're not going to say, "Oh well, math's math's over. I'm canceling math. No more math." <laughs> um, you're going to say, "Yeah, exactly." Um, what fundamental assumptions were too strong that they led me to this contradiction? Right, and that's from a mathematical standpoint. From a physics standpoint, you're going to be like, "Okay, well, what could what else could be happening? What?" which things that I thought were true aren't, you know? And then you approach it that way. Like if I, so I I just completed a master's in math. And if in another life I had become a mathematician and I had proved that one plus one equals three, I wouldn't kill myself. I would be like, I am the best mathematician that has ever existed. There is <laughs> no one better. This is awesome. Put my name on a mountain. Like I did, it. <laughs> you know, I have... So many people have worked on mathematics, fund, you know, like fundamental mathematics, that they all miss this, and I got it. Like, what up? You know, like, where is my mountain? Give me a mountain, and then also put my name on it. I think in this case, though, it'd be like, you wrote one <laughs> plus one equals three, and then when you went to go show someone, and you wrote down one plus one, and now it equals four, and then the next time yeah. you show someone, it equals a quarter. Exactly. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so there's no so, level of reproducibility to your work. 
Right, right. Well, actually, you would get that. If I could prove that 1 plus 1 equals 3, then I actually get 1 plus 1 equals anything. So, but what, what Colbert is it. saying is that in the book, they use this analogy of like um, doing something on a pool table. So like setting up this exact shot and shooting and, you know, like playing out uh, a move or, you know, shooting the cue ball on a pool table. Now do it five sec or five minutes later. Now move the pool table uh, to the other side of the room and rotate it and do it again. And what they were trying to show was that like you do the same experiment over and over again and you get different results, even though they shouldn't, the results should be consistent. Right. So that's fine. That makes sense. But that assumes a bunch of things. It assumes that physics is space invariant. It assumes that physics is time invariant. It assumes that you're actually controlling for everything else. There was a theory um, a while ago that um, light moves through the ether, that every single wave has to propagate through some sort of substance, and that lights, the substance that light was propagating through was called the ether. And the ether is obviously a thing that exists, and the earth is moving in a circular path, so unless the ether, unless the earth is stationary and the entire universe is moving around the earth, then it would make sense that light experiments or, you know, other experiments would change depending on the season, right? Because the earth would be in a different place going in a different direction around the sun, right? So that's, that's the theory of the ether, but you're not, there isn't an ether. That's not, well, I mean, quantum field theory is what it is, but like, the ether as they understood it is not a real thing. So maybe there is something ether-like that you're not controlling for because you've never observed it in any way. So maybe your experiment would act a different way five minutes later across the room, rotated 90 degrees. You know what I mean? Sure. But you're also, you have to realize you're working against an intelligent entity that's gaslighting you. So maybe yeah. well, that's that's surprise, five minutes that's after the, that, yeah. <laughs> five minutes after that, your experiment works the way it should. Right. And five minutes of that, you you will never actually know to what level your assumptions are wrong. Right. That's the reveal. I'm. I wanted to stick just a little bit longer on yeah, this I'm before sorry. that. No, no, no. Please, no. Your reveal is a good one. Um, because we uh, asked you this basic question before on a Q and A episode, where we're like, "Well, what if math breaks?" With the suggestion yeah. of the answer, it's going to be like that's hard, right? And you were like, "Actually, no. It'd be great." It'd be great because we would just have new math. <laughs> yeah, math has broken several times already, and and we still have math. And here's the twist, and this is why Adrian bounced off the book twice, is <laughs> he was frustrated by the idea that these scientists and physicists or whatever were actually not feeling what they should feel, which is elation at new science and new math. It was it's, it's, because they were, what? It's frustrated elation, but yeah, it's still elation. Yeah, but it's because they were being like, quantum level gaslit and mentally tortured to suicide by aliens which was that was the reveal ultimately that's why that was happening with which which is an, uh, an explanation of sorts so how do they do the thing it's called sophons or they are called sophons this is the interfering agent this is something that since they take 400 years to get here more since they're taking more than 400 years to get here they have to send something at light speed to try to slow us down ahead of time so it's a bit of a head start. Sorry, Chris. Near light speed. Yep. It's not light. Exactly. It's not light. Yeah. Um, and so that agent is the Sophon, which is like we took a proton and unfolded it over 11 dimensions or whatever, wrote a computer on it, and folded it back up and sent it to your house. Right. So pretty much it. <laughs> Imagine if you had a computer board the size of a planet's surface folded up into a proton. Exactly. Um. Right. So a couple of problems with this, um, but yeah, this is not a, this is not a thing. Um, well, so hold on. this is not a thing as we currently understand the universe. This is, this is the Trisolan uh, point though, is as we understand it and we never will. <laughs> um, right now it appears as if there are three dimensions, three spatial dimensions around us. So the, um, <laughs> 12 or 13 or 14 spatial dimensions that sometimes come out of string theory, the way we get to there is we say that they're all small and folded up. So the idea of unfolding a, uh, a you know, a small, small particle into 11-dimensional space 
isn't compatible with how we see the universe right now because there aren't those extended 11 dimensions to unfold the particle into. Right now, every single thing, every single experiment we we do should like tells us that there are three spatial dimensions, right? I I don't know. I'm trying to confirm that. I don't know the extent of every single <laughs> physics experiment that's being done, and there's no way that you are either. Um, but hey. from my understanding of the current state of physics and physics experimentation, it appears as if there are three extended spatial dimensions uh, and one extended time dimension. Um, right. So that's how we that's our current model of the universe right and and it seems to conform it seems to make predictions very well about how things work like we don't have neptune slipping into some you know other three extended dimensions and we can't see it anymore like that's not a thing that has ever happened and we don't expect it to happen um so the in our current understanding of the universe there is nowhere to unfold this thing into this um, other space. There is no other space to unfold these uh, fun these uh, tiny particles into. So that's that's the first thing. <laughs> that's my first objection. Um, second thing is information is massive. Information is massive. There is a mass with information. Um, this computer that they we mean information theory type information, which might be a whole episode to start getting into. Is there like an intro here for that? <laughs> no, I'm just going to say it. I'm going to state it right, without, right. you know, any any cognitive backup. But information is massive. Um, this computer would be a big thing. Um, the information, like this is a very complicated computer. This is an AI, you know, a general AI that can be sent, you know, four light years away from its programmers and do the jobs that it wants to do. Um, they also communicate with it, I believe, at light speed. There's some, no, faster than light speed. I think there's some quantum entanglement shenanigans happening. Yeah. I think, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Um, which, again, also there's some problems with that. But this is a massive thing. So they're treating it like it's still the, you know, like a, a tiny, uh, like, it's basically a proton with a brain. But the thing is that brain has mass, and I don't think if they ever talk about the implications of that. Because uh -huh. they have this thing doing, uh, they have this thing interacting with um, a person's um, rods and cones. They make these sophons actually induce um, hallucinate. Well, they're not hallucinations because the person is, their their uh, rods and cones are actually triggering. Um, yeah, it's literally the, the input they're getting. Yeah, they're, they're, they're touching somebody's uh, sight center so that they see a, a, a clock that's ticking down. Um, or directly think of it as a proton with a brain. I love the proton with a brain. Did they say that in the book? Because that's a wonderful way to put it. Um, I don't know. I mean, it was yeah, it might. a supercomputer at the yeah, size but it's, of it's, went fully folded up. And then so imagine that you have a proton with a brain that can directly interfere with your quantum, with your quantum experimentation, all that, right? Not at every level. Your you're being not just your quantum experiment well yeah at every level the human level is really the important thing because mm -hmm. at the end of the day every single in experiment that we do is recorded by a human and analyzed by a human so you know there are no experiments that are ha well the uh, i hate stumbling over myself but the entire universe is constantly doing experiments that we never observe but really <laughs> when we're talking about like the human pursuit of science everything is ultimately documented and interpreted by a human so you can have like uh electrons being counted but at the end of the day that is a number that is written in a paper for peer review by a human being so um right the experiment of this person seeing is um affected by these sophons or I, I, maybe just one one sophon just like shooting in and out of this person's eye forcing them to see this counting down clock wherever they look and also through a camera i think there was there was a lot of shenanigans this sofan was doing so many gaslighting shenanigans it was um, very busy right but the point is this thing would be way more massive than a proton right and if it is in fact zipping out of this person's eye so fast like it would be doing damage. It would be like put your hand in a <laughs> in a linear in a particle accelerator beam damage, hmm, um, right? Because we're not talking about person. proton massless particles. We're talking about this thing with mass should be right. exceptionally large considering the information at hand, 
And then also, like, how much energy are we talking about when we're moving that thing around that fast with that much mass? Exactly. So satisfying to me having read it from, you know, a godlike perspective of the reader, um, but not very satisfying for the person who's being gaslit. Yeah. And oh, man, by the time we get to books two and then three, yeah, all over again, it's like these new huge levels of exposure to amazing ideas. Like, this is how much the world has. This is what the universe has going on, and it's really incredible. On and on and on, and it keeps stacking. And that's the most I would say, is that this gets yeah. nuts. What else? And Yeah, I could, that's kind of it. There's one disaffected person that ruined it for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> or, or ultimately, perhaps it works out really well. It's too early to say. I mean, come on. One person decided. One person said to the aliens, like, hey, we suck. You should come on over. I mean, we have a f- we have a few people saying right now, "Hey, I want to be rich, so fuck this planet." I mean, that's a real thing that is happening right now, and they have a lot of power, so they're actually able to say that with impact. But that wasn't this person. This person was was just was just the misanthropic. You know, humanity is too much garbage. Please just wipe it away. That's a whole other bad sort of thing I don't want. And so now we have looking forward yeah, I'm on to team that guy right now. <laughs> Uh, what is humanity going to do, not just after contact with aliens, which is the traditional narrative, but with a 400-year notice on contact with aliens, which is a, a very special way of looking at it. First contact game theory comes up. How exceptional is humanity? Do we deserve this? What are we going to do? And that's all a bunch of questions for probably next year when we do the next book. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll let you know when I get back to it. Um, but I've got so much media right now. Also, and, something we neglected to mention about the Sophons is, in light of the, it's going to take them 400 years to get here, that adds in the... The Trisolarans. Yeah, the Trisolarans, the physical embodiment of the aliens. This adds um, an immediacy, like they're here messing with us tangibly, and it's something to deal with. Yeah, it's a little less of the like climate change, where you're describing because, a problem that's coming. Yeah, like humans wouldn't care. Like 400 <laughs> years, someone will deal with it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> they would, wouldn't uh, they? There was one more topic. Sorry, um, I know we're we're gonna wrap up soon, but I want to go back to it. Um, mm-hmm. The there is faster than light communication in this um, in this book via quantum entanglement. I believe you mentioned um, that. Yeah, yeah. If, if that is the case, that is not a thing. Um, quantum entanglement is uh, so spooky it. action at a distance where. I can change a, I can entangle two particles, send one very far away, and then change one at my side, and that will, quote, instantaneously change one at the other side, it's right? faster than That's light correlation. All, it's faster than light, right. However, there are a couple of non-intuitive weirdnesses in, um, in, uh, in the quantum world, um, like the no-cloning theorem, like, there are you you cannot use quantum entanglement to communicate faster than light. It was pretty much in all the experiments that were done, you need some kind of side channel to actually transmit any data. So you're still limited a, by light speed. Exactly. And yes, it has to be it has to be um light uh, speed or slower. Otherwise you have just noise. You have a correlated noise, but you have no actual meaningful information. So just I absolutely had to say that, that anytime we like, again, it, it is a misconception to think that quantum entanglement and um, the faster than light effects of quantum entanglement imply um, faster than light communication, because as we understand things, they do not. That's three body problem. That is the first book. What do we learn? Oh, what did I learn? I learned a bunch of uh, Chinese history. Yeah, and then I forgot about it. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't learn the Chinese history because I didn't have the footnotes. <laughs> we wound I learned the there were footnotes that I should have had. Oh, man. I've learned that people exist outside of my, you know, my realm. Cultural of, bubble? Yeah, perception. No, not even outside my cultural bubble. Like, I don't know what's going on out in the person down the street's life. But if oh. you put it in a book, I'll I'll read about it. You especially don't know now because we don't go outside anymore. Yeah, exactly. So recommended related stuff. We mentioned we did one other. It's we did. Yes, we did one, already one episode on a work by Leo Sishin, which is The Wandering Earth. It was actually a movie and it's on Netflix in the United States and it's around other places, too. 
So that was decipherscifi.com slash 182. I hope we'll do more of those. And the other thing we mentioned to link to would be seasons, not so much one, but two and three of the three body problem Minecraft animated series, which I'm actually planning to watch now because it has gotten to be pretty good. Um, also recommended related stuff, Ted Chang's short story. Which one was it? It was. The story is called Division by Zero, and it was in Stories of Your Life. Friend of the show, Ted Chang. Yeah, right on. So in his book, Stories of Your Life, which is the, no, Story of Your Life is the name of the story that Arrival is based on. The book oh, is named it. Stories of Your Life because it's confusing. And the collection. that collection of stories uh, includes the story we mentioned, which is the What If Math Broke. Yeah. And in Ted Chang fashion, it was a really good take. Um, still made me angry, as a couple of his books did, but no, I, I love Ted Chang's work. It's awesome. <laughs> so so we recommended some stuff, and Ted Chang. And Adrian, what do you recommend? Uh, I mean, Ted Chang also. Uh, How about, always. normally we're like, this person's from this place, and here's their show, or whatever, but Adrian doesn't yeah. have well, a thing. I mean, I am working on a thing, which I hope to be able to share with you two um, fairly soon. Um I enjoy teaching, um, and I don't do that professionally, and uh, I don't do that recreationally, but sometimes I like to put together little presentations and and have people go through them and maybe learn a thing. So I am working on one right now, and it is it is a thing that might happen. Okay. Follow Decipher Sci-Fi and Adrian B. Falcone on Twitter, and we'll see what happens there. Is that good? And then... Uh, Let's, we can also recommend, I guess, considering supporting your creators online. Yes. Adrian knows about that. Yeah, for a long time. It is. Yeah, right? You were right in the door in the beginning, and we still haven't figured it out how. Yeah. Um, it is tough times for a lot of people. So definitely, like, if this is the difference between, you know, eating and not, probably use the money for eating. You could probably no, definitely supporting. use the money for eating. <laughs> okay, definitely. Yeah, definitely. listen listen to our episode on how to make sourdough sourdough starter and then <laughs> make a bunch of bread with that. We had some episodes about pickles, I think, at some point. So get some of that. <laughs> we've, we've definitely had an episode that was fueled by burgers. So yes, <laughs> eating eating is a top priority. But um, if you can't make a donation, uh, definitely share the content. Um, I every time this shows up on social media, I share it. So. This show specifically. Um, don't do th- I don't do that for any other show. Uh, it's just this one. Not so. even bum bum bam bam. Nope they they're fine. They'll do okay. Uh, I support. <laughs> they them. don't need well, your help. <laughs> as soon as you start touring, uh, then I will support you by going to your shows. But I already do that for them, so they're good. <laughs> okay, that's fair. With that said, I'd still like to thank everyone who is supporting this show, and if, of all times, now we appreciate it very much. They are Joe Ferraro. Lucas Blazing Firework. Alan Michael Pulls Lightspeed Superman. Man, that's got to suck for a long time. <laughs> well, if you fly at light speed, all times are simultaneous. <laughs> that's funny. So Thanks. good for you, Alan Michael Pools. Also, Dean at LSG Media, NDP at Bash 25 Comics, Terrence Lee, Soft Interfaces with Uzi Steve Fisher, Chris Superdimensional Nipples Gennard. They're just points. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. 11 dimension fold uh, 11 dimensional folded nipples man when they unfold they're huge <laughs> oh my god those nipples <laughs> dinner plates the size of a planet also the new guy again larry anderson so larry again thank you for coming on recently just in time for us to tell you to read a book also, Brian the Sexy's brother Peterson, Andrew Capitcho the Mighty, Jeff Ramish Schwarterman, Michael the Giantess Peterson, Sammy Mumby, Igor Smolensky, Josh Effigy of LHD Media, Mr. Ray Gun Curly Phil, Tim Asikama His Arms Wide, John Jwares, Aileen Milk Hydration Bath Matt Greek, Gina Lomolino, Adrian Mahala Dinosaur Hunter, Arcopia FF Joe Ruppel, Grandma's Boy Free Trigar, Carmen Lee Valdez McCoy, Jeremy the Top Poster, The Star Led Adam Piper, Naked Alien Terrorist, A Lot of Ron, Scotty M. Scotty doesn't know. What does Scotty know? Scotty doesn't know fundamental physics. I guess, yeah. Quantum entanglement communications. <laughs> Come on, Scotty. Also. <laughs> Pathetic. Step it up. And Donnie Bayori, Buggy Dear Luke Pelly, Alaric Dirk and Gunarmed Superhero, Daniel James Barker of Uncertain Principle Podcast, and Adrian Falcone of this podcast right now. This time, what up?
Yeah, and hopefully as soon as possible for the next book. Maybe next year. <laughs> I heard somebody mention, and I guess this is just the, the character density of Chinese, is like, wow, the Chinese version of this book is really small. Uh, it's only 302 pages, and I definitely read books every now and then that are over 1,000. So this wasn't that big, actually. Pages, wasn't wait, wait. It? the English version is 300 pages? Ah, three, it's 400 pages, says Amazon. The English version. Yeah. The Chinese version is only 300. That seems wrong. Why? Because Chinese character density, right? No, well, I'm saying the information density of Chinese characters. When one character is a word, you can fit a lot of words in. Right, so shouldn't it be like 100 pages? Oh, oh, shouldn't it be even smaller? Good point, though. Uh, where were we? And why are we talking about the number of pages in the book? If you read in Chinese, it might be quicker. That's all. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Step one. <laughs> Chinese. Opens notes. <laughs> Learn Chinese. <laughs> you can shave a quarter off your, your reading time. <laughs> And, uh, John, champion of dry beavers. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Poor guy. I like my beavers wet. That's their natural environment, after all. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Stinky and wet. Vanilla. Also, DJ, stinky wet beaver Moffat. And my mom and Grandma Judy, who's right here. We could say hi to her if we wanted She's, she's right over in, there. She's been in the room the whole time. Shaking her head. <laughs> the video's <laughs> off. You don't know. <laughs> she's got her arms crossed. <laughs> Bless your heart, Chris. Slowly. Liked, Bless your heart. I liked everything until the wet beavers. That was too much for me. <laughs> You've uh, met Grandma Judy, dude. That's how yeah. she sounds like. <laughs> let's get through these. Let's get through these backers. Come on. We're getting through. Where are we? Jocularity. Daddy's got to eat second lunch. Second lunch, I'm going to say. I had, what'd you have for first lunch? An English muffin with peanut butter. Damn, you fancy. Sounds good. Yeah, like, dude. was it all hot so the peanut butter got melty? Oh, hell yeah. No, nice. no, I had a cold, I had a cold English muffin like a fucking psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> you probably split it with a knife. <laughs> You're a restaurant man, Chris. When, when, who would ever had just like take a, no, I took it out of the fridge. I, I grabbed it and, and, and just like pulled it apart um, long wise, and then I just dunked it in some peanut butter and just licked the peanut butter off. So you had a St. Louis style. <laughs> anyway, uh, and a magical flying MPS unicorn drilling Creighton. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. And Adrian. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thanks for going to decyphermedia.tv slash support the show to support the shows. I went to a different uh, URL, but that, that was in the before times. They're more or less equivalent. The thing is, I actually have the website completely migrated over from decipher sci-fi to decyphermedia.tv right now if you go there it's just decipher history and a front page and it just goes to the old site for the sci-fi show i have to get around to doing that the problem is it's very likely to blow up most people's podcast players with like a hundred no 200 something new downloads just because of you know like id mismatches and the url changes and whatever uh might just want to rip off that band-aid but we'll see I'll let you people know. Keep an eye on us on Twitter. And that site is decyphermedia.tv. That's where you can go to, to subscribe or send uh, anyone you think might like our show. Like Adrian and Grandma Judy. Dude, I'm sorry that circumstances made it so this was not uh, having you over for burgers again, unfortunately. But thank no, you for coming. We'll do, it. we'll do it again. Eventually, yes. It will yes. be an after time. Now is the during time. We will have, we'll do it again during the after time. And that's it. That was the Three Body Problem. That was Adrian. Thank you so much. And that was the second time we did a book on the show. That's a special occasion. Ooh. Reading is hard. That's why I use that's my great. ears. <laughs> Bye. See you. Bye, guys. I left an orange on the floor in that bodega, and now you're going to die. When y'all go silent, I don't know if I'm dropping truth bombs or if it's a stinky bomb. <laughs>